Hello, friends. When we last left Jesus, we had noted that there were two very different ways of responding to him. On the one hand, there was a group of people who really liked Jesus. These were the people who were marginalized, the people who had been beaten up by life, the people who were sick. I mean, anybody who felt disenfranchised, they really liked Jesus. He brought them good news. But on the other hand, there was a group of people who had a vested interest in the status quo. They were not wanting the Messiah to come. It would threaten them. These were the religious leaders. And these were the ones who are involved in this conflict. And now there is this crescendo of conflict. And it gets to the last week of Jesus' life. He's invited, along with his disciples, to a, a dinner. And so Jesus is there. He's seated at the table, although probably a, a, a short table. They're on pillows around, sitting on the floor. Jesus is there, and a woman came, comes in. Now Jesus has been talking about his death. He's been telling his disciples, I have to go to Jerusalem, and I am going to die to break death. And they think it's a metaphor. They think it's a figure of speech, like, okay, yeah, in some way he's going to die, but, I mean, it doesn't occur to them that he might literally mean die, because that would be the end. That's the only paradigm they have, is death is the end, and they have no idea what's in store. But there is a woman who has been hearing Jesus talk about death, and she gets it. So she comes into the room now, and she has in her hand a white stone uh, vase, uh, an alabaster vase. That's that soft, white, translucent stone. And in this vase is a special kind of perfume, a perfume which is only used to anoint the bodies of the dead. This was part of the Jewish ritual. It was an expensive uh, a bit of perfume. In fact, it says it was a, a year's wages. So we're thinking, what, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of perfume. That's very expensive perfume. She comes in the room. She stands behind Jesus. And people are probably like, what's she doing there? And in an act of violence, perhaps with a stone in her hand, I don't know what, but she cracks open the vase right over Jesus' head and the perfume spills down on him, on his hair, on across his face, down onto his clothing. The smell of death permeates the room. You've probably been in a funeral parlor where there are so many flowers that you walk in and it's just almost an affront of death. You can just smell it and it's not a good smell of flowers. It's the smell of too many flowers in a room. Well, that's kind of what this would have smelled like to those disciples. One of the disciples, when he sees the woman waste, this perfume jumps up. And he accuses her and he says, Woman, what have you done? Don't you know you should have sold that perfume and given the money to the poor? And Jesus says to him, Take it easy, Judas. She has done a thing of beauty to me. She gets me. She has poured the anointing oil on my body even before it's dead because she understands what I'm up to. And I have to imagine that the rest of the week there was that smell really of death because the oil would have permeated Jesus' clothes. A few days later that week, now towards the end of that week, it was Passover week. Jesus is sitting around with the disciples. It's dinner time. And he's wanting really to make sure they get it, that they understand the significance of what's going on. So he takes a loaf of bread and he says, he says gentlemen, the loaf of bread, and he tears it in two and he says, just as this loaf of bread is torn in two, so my body is going to be torn in two. Then he takes the wine and swirls it and he says, just as the wine is poured out, 
so my blood is going to be poured out for you. And when that happens, when my body is broken, when my blood is poured out, don't think they're doing it to me, that somehow how I'm the victim here. You need to know, and that's why I'm telling you in advance, I am doing this. This is my choice. I am the protagonist. He takes his cloak off, the one that smells like death, lays it down, finds a towel, tucks it in his belt, gets a basin of water, and then he, as the leader, he, as the teacher, he, as the rabbi, kneels down in front of his disciples and one by one takes their sandals off and begins to wash their feet. Well, this is backwards. This isn't the way leadership works. He gets to Peter and Peter says, uh -uh, you're not going to wash my feet. You forget, I know who you are, remember? And this is, this is just inappropriate. Jesus says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And then Peter, in his usual exaggerated way, says, well, in that case, then, dump the whole basin over me. Give me, give, give me a shower of it. And Jesus says, no, try to, try to keep up, Peter. I'm trying to show you something about how you should treat each other. He says, if I, being the teacher, being the leader, being the master, I mean, if I'm washing your feet, Shouldn't you also wash each other's feet? Hmm. It's interesting to me that he washed Peter's feet full well knowing that before the sun were to arise the next morning, Peter was the one who was going to say three times, Jesus, hmm, no, never met the guy. No, Jesus who? No, I don't think I, no, no, don't know him. He was going to deny him three times, and here Jesus is gently washing his feet. You know who else was in that room, don't you? Yeah, mm -hmm. Judas. And Jesus washes Judas' feet, knowing that Judas is the one, the betrayer, the one who in a few hours will lead the mob to him. And yet he washes his feet. And he says to all of them, he says, you don't really get it yet. You don't really understand what I've done. But I'm trying to model for you how you should treat each other. They sang a hymn. Then he says, come on, let's go out to the prayer place. So they leave, they leave town, they go down, they cross the valley, and they go into a little a little olive grove. Now I know the name of this grove. It was called Gethsemane. It's right there at the base of the appropriately named Mount of Olives, right? So there are olive trees there and Jesus tells his disciples, you guys stay here and pray. And he goes about, uh, about a stone's throw distance away and he throws himself down in the ground, his face is in the olive leaves down there with olives which have fallen and there's this acrid smell and he, and he begins to call out to the Father and he says, Father, isn't there another way? Isn't there a plan B? I know we talked about this before the foundations of the earth were laid, but is there another way? Nevertheless, I submit to your will. I will not insist on what I want. I will submit to your will. Then he goes back and the disciples are sleeping. He comes back and prays. Three times he has that prayer and he says, Father, if you could, I don't want to drink this cup. Is there another cup to drink? But I will do what you say. And he prays fervently. He comes back again and he gets the disciples up and he says, forget about praying. Never mind. Wake up. Because now, here comes Judas leading the mob. They, this is a mob. They're armed. These are ruffians. They've got clubs. They've got their torches. And they arrest Jesus. They 
take them in. They have all these kind of trials. They're really mock trials. But the craziest thing is the way they mock him. So here he is, the creator of the universe. The one who created each one of these Roman soldiers out of love and they're spitting on him and they're slapping him and they're blindfolding him and then they slap him again and they said, okay, now tell us, who was that? Was that Claudius or was that me? I mean, the, the world has gone mad. God himself and they're making fun of him and he just takes it. Because he's about something bigger. Finally, Pilate, the Roman governor, acquiesces to the demands of the mob. They're crying, crucify him, crucify him. And finally, he washes his hands of the matter. He says, okay, do what you want. Take him away. And they take Jesus away. Now this is, of course, the next day. This is Friday. They take him away. And they literally drive nails in his hands and his feet and they place him I mean so they, they're nailing him to this wooden cross and then they raise the cross up in the air and it sets down and it's in the hole they've dug and now here he is the Messiah being crucified most of the men had fled a couple of them were still watching from a distance, but the women were watching. They probably didn't feel as threatened as the men did, so the women are watching, and I imagine them kind of nudging each other with an elbow and saying, any moment now, any moment now, those Romans are going to see, he's going to leap off the cross full of full of life and he's going to kill them all and he's going to bring freedom back to Israel. You just watch any second now. But as the moments wore on and the moments turned into hours and Jesus' body sank, low, sank lower and lower on the cross, uh, they perhaps began to lose some hope in hope. Finally, he calls out, Eloi! Eloi! Lama sabachthani? Oh, the psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And now the women are even more apprehensive. What does that mean? Why has God forsaken him? And then he breathes his last. He says, it is finished. And the women saw hope. The women watched as a man named Joseph from the town of Arimathea came and along with his friend Nicodemus, they pulled the nails out of the wood and they lowered the now dead body of Jesus of Nazareth. Joseph had purchased a long strip of cloth and they wrapped Jesus' body in the cloth. Now it's evening and they have to hurry before sundown. They take the body and they place it in a tomb which was nearby. Now when I say tomb, don't think about the kind, at least around here when, when people die and they're buried, uh, we dig a hole in the ground and then we place a coffin down in the ground and then throw dirt on top. But this isn't the way the tombs were in those days. Uh, this particular tomb would have been more like a cave. It's a small cave. In fact, this one had been chiseled out. I mean, people had chiseled it out. They had hired this small cave dug, and this is where they put the body of Jesus. Then, because some people had heard Jesus saying that after he died, he would rise again. And they thought, well, we don't want any mischief here. So the Romans rolled a big stone over in front of that opening of the tomb, just so nothing could happen. And in fact, the Romans placed some guards there so nothing could happen. The women watched all that. 
That was Friday night. And on Saturday, the whole world, the whole universe, held its breath. Early Sunday morning, the women got dressed in the dark. The sun wasn't up yet. They tucked bottles of oil under their arms, bundles of spices under their arms, and then noiselessly lifted the latch. They didn't want to, want to wake up the men folk. Lifted the latch and slipped out onto the now still streets of the city of Jerusalem. It had been a tumultuous week in Jerusalem, but now the dust had settled. The big day was over of Passover. Pilgrims would start returning home pretty soon, but now everyone was still sleeping. The women who had come down from the north must have felt that they had been duped, they had been tricked. I mean, how could, how could this have happened? They had seen him change water into wine. They had seen him heal a man born blind. They had seen him raise the dead, dead daughter of Jairus. They had seen him raise up that widow's son in Nain. They had seen Lazarus dead four days be brought back to life by him. They were sure he was hope. They were sure he was the Messiah. And now, I mean, had he been a, a deceiver? Had he been a, a charlatan, a cheat? How could this have happened? And the women are just without any emotional energy. They're simply walking toward the tomb to do what good Jewish women should be, and that is anoint the dead body of Jesus of Nazareth. The only thing they said to each other was, who's going to roll the stone away for, away for us? But when they got to the tomb, the stone wasn't there. In fact, they noticed that the whole garden appeared like something big had happened. I mean, plants were blown over or trampled over. There were no Roman soldiers there. Just the big gaping hole of that tomb. And the women are like, well, let's go look. So they go up there, they duck in, they go in the little door to the tomb. The first thing they see is that long strip of cloth that Joseph of Arimathea had purchased and in which they had wrapped the body of Jesus. But now there's the strip of cloth, but there is no body there. The next thing they see is the piece of cloth that had been placed on Jesus' head. It is neatly folded and laying there, but there is no body there. Then the women realize that they're not alone in the tomb. There are two other bees beings there. I'm not going to say men, I'm going to say beings there with them. Later, when the women tried to describe what those beings were like, they didn't have enough words. Their vocabulary fell short, and they said they were shiny. They looked like snow dressed in lightning. And these, these two beings said to the women, Ladies, what are you doing here? This is a place for dead people. And he's not dead. <laughs> no, no, he's nowhere near dead. <laughs> Go on now. Go tell the men folk. So the women stumble out of the tomb and now the sun's up and their, their minds are confused. They don't know what to think about this. They go back and tell the men and the men are like, oh, you women with your old wives tales and the men run and they're just they see the tomb and they're just as confused that afternoon they call a meeting they all gather in this one room they lock the doors they shut the windows because they're afraid that the romans are going to come for them and knock 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 and drag another one off to be crucified so they're trying to make a plan and they're arguing about what has happened where is the body of jesus when suddenly boom there he is in the midst of them jesus himself alive. And he says to them, peace. And they're all like, oh, it's the ghost.
ghost of Jesus. It's the ghost of Jesus. Because they saw him die. It's the ghost of Jesus. And he said, no, no, I'm not a ghost. And they're still in. Said, it's the ghost of Jesus. They had no other suggestion in their minds of what could have happened. It must be the ghost of Jesus. And Jesus very cleverly says, does anyone here have anything to eat? Somebody found a bit of fish and they gave it to him because everyone knows that ghosts, I mean, they're spirits. Ghosts cannot eat. Ghosts cannot drink. So Jesus took that bit of fish. He ate it with real teeth. He swallowed it down a real esophagus. It went into a real stomach and their understanding, beginning to understand, he has a body. He shows them his hands and his feet and he shows them his where the spear went in his side when they were crucifying him. It's a real body. But it was a body that had just somehow gone through the walls and come in here. It's a new kind of body. In fact, this is the first one ever body. This is the first resurrected body. Now, you remember that there have been a lot of resuscitated bodies, right? Lazarus. Jairus' daughter, Old Testament, there are some cases of people who had died and were resuscitated. Life came back into them, but that's nothing like a resurrected body. There has, up to this point in time, I mean today, now, there has only been one resurrected body, and he is the first. And so as we look to that resurrected body, we can get some idea about what our resurrected bodies will be like. But I need to alert you to something, and that is... Only those who follow Jesus in life will follow him into the resurrection. That's an important qualifier. Only those who follow Jesus in life will follow him in the resurrection. I want one of those resurrected body, a body that can eat and yet that can go through walls. Later on that same afternoon, Two of his disciples are walking along a road. One of them was named Cleopas. And they're downhearted. They, they don't know what has happened. Uh, and suddenly a stranger comes up and starts walking with them. And the stranger says, hey, what's wrong with you fellows? Why so downhearted? And they say, what, are you the only stranger here in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened this week? And the stranger says, what, what are you talking about? Tell me about it. And so they told him the story. Well, this guy named Jesus, we thought he was the Messiah. He did all sorts of miracles. And then they killed him on Friday. And strangest thing is now the women folk came and said they can't find his body and we don't know what to think. And the stranger said, well, that doesn't seem odd to me. And then the stranger began explaining the prophecies of the Old Testament to, him, to them, explaining how it was necessary that the Messiah would have to suffer and die in order to break death. They got to the little inn, the restaurant, where the two travelers, two disciples were going, and they said, come on in with us. And the stranger said, no, I can't, I gotta go on. And they said, no, come on in with us. Okay, I'll go in with you. So they all three go in, they sit down, and the stranger took bread and began to break it. And as he broke it, they realized, oh, that, that's you. It's Jesus right here. And poof, Jesus is gone. You see his resurrected body, it was still him. But it was different, wasn't it? You see, our resurrected bodies, we're still going to be us. But it's going to be the kind of body we would have had had we not been born into a broken world and had we not spent a lifetime of all the things that have happened to us. It'll be the kind of body we would have, could have, should have, would have always had. This is the promise of the resurrection. This is the good news. As Isaiah says, the shroud of death which has been thrown over all humanity will be pulled away. Death will no longer be our enemy. The sting of death, the agony of death, the grief of death will be gone. And those who follow Jesus in life will follow him in the resurrection.
And this is good news for you and for me. I invite you to follow Jesus in life. Follow him. I mean, it's a simple word. And I'll remind you that following Jesus is different from hanging out with people who follow Jesus. Following Jesus means seeing where he goes, going where he goes, seeing how he acts, acting as he acts. It means letting him heal us in every sense of the word and then participating with him in this ministry. But we do not do it alone. Sure, with other people, but I mean something else. So go back with me to that room for a moment on that Sunday afternoon, that first Easter. Remember when he ate the fish? Go back with me there because Jesus did something, which is also good news. He blew on them symbolically. It kind of reminds us like in Genesis when God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and Eve and suddenly they were alive, Jesus blew on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the good spirit. We are not alone, my friends. We have a helper, a counselor, a friend. And then he said to them and to us, as the Father has sent me, in that same way, I am sending you. Follow Jesus in life. Follow him in the resurrection. Amen.